Ladies and gentlemen, start your engines. Today on Todd's Video Games and More, we are discussing all things Atari Pole Position. Now, Pole Position was developed by Namco and licensed by Atari, came to the arcades in late 1982. It's considered one of the most influential games, arcade games of all time, and the most influential racing game of all time. As a matter of fact, this was the number one grossing game in 1983 and 1984 and still in the top five in 1985. Now when I got this game it was just a mess of parts. I've done a lot to it. You may have seen it in the background of my other videos such as the Tron restoration. But we've got it done. It's beautiful and I'm glad you're here because I want you to join me on this journey. So sit back, relax, and prepare to qualify. So we're heading up to uh, Marion, Indiana to pick up another arcade game. This time it's Pole Position. So we're looking forward to seeing what kind of shape that one's in. All right, so here we have a Pole Position. This is some parts here with some extra parts over here that we've just picked up. We're up in a little north of Indianapolis. Another monitor over there, so we're gonna do this project. This is Pole Position, the number one arcade hit from Atari and Nemco. You're behind the wheel of a Grand Prix racer with all the horsepower you can handle, maybe even a little too much. Pole Position, Atari's most realistic video game ever, now in the arcades. And for the Atari 5200 Super System, it's just around the corner. Today's going to be pole position day. Here's the monitor that came with it. And it's pretty dirty, so we're going to clean that up. We got some pedals here to work on, get the rust off and retread. Got a coin door just hanging out. Got a shell of a cabinet here with another monitor inside that's been stripped down. Everything's very dirty, obviously. And if we come back around to the other side, Here's what we have here, but we've just got an absolute mess inside. Just a wreck. Okay, so you can see I can got, I've got some of the guts out of this thing. Got things disconnected, got the old monitor out. And looking at the wiring harness, I can see it's gonna be a little more of a problem than I had originally anticipated. There's lots of just cut wires, wires hanging off out of the harness. Things like that is cut down inside as well. So he uh, gave me an extra wiring harness, so it looks like I'll be using that. And then there's a lot of debris in here to clean out. Bye. 
Here's the transformer section of the game. It's out. Pretty rusty, pretty gnarly looking. We'll have to clean that up. But now we've got everything out of the base, so we can start cleaning up the base inside. Get this looking snazzy. So I just took the marquee off of this, and this is what it looks like inside up here. Yikes. That may be even worse than I thought it was gonna be. We'll get it all cleaned out. On this transformer, we've got some pretty bad rust and corrosion. So I'm gonna use some of this three-in-one penetrant to get in here and kind of soak into some of these spots like this and right here. And we're gonna disassemble this thing and get it all cleaned up, rust off, looking shiny new. I'm gonna be recapping this monitor chassis, which is really the process of changing all those little black or blue cylindrical things sticking up. You can see one right there. Um, before I do that though, I'm gonna clean it off really well and I'm gonna do something that seems counterintuitive to most people, but I'm gonna spray it off with a bunch of cleaner and degreaser and then I'm going to rinse it off in the sink. You can do that as long as you thoroughly dry everything uh, before you put it back together and send any electricity into it, obviously. So I'm gonna take some isopropyl alcohol and run it over the boards. And that'll wash out some of the extra water and moisture and clean off the mineralizations and things like that that's in the water. I've got the transformer assembly down in a couple gallons almost of the vapor rust. And it's one of my favorite products, this rust remover. I'm gonna, I've got some bowls here for some of the other parts but you just leave it in there basically overnight and pretty much all the rust dissolves away and it doesn't harm any of the other you know, plastics or anything else that are part of the assembly. And some of these bolts and nuts are supposed to be black. They go on the control panel tops, things like that and removing the rust removes that black layer. But I have some black oxide concentrate here and it's one part that to nine parts distilled water. We're gonna mix it up, just drop the nuts and bolts right down in there and get them all blackened again. I did a fantastic job on those. I mean, they look absolutely brand new. Now here's our tangled up wiring mess. It's all dirty, filthy. I think I'm gonna do the dishwasher trick on this. Just throw the whole thing in the dishwasher and wash it. All right, it's dishwasher safe, question mark. <laughs> well, that looks much better. Easy trick. I'll just set this out in the sun, let it dry. Now I have it laid on its back and I can access the bottom of it. I'm going to add some casters to the bottom. I like to have all my games on casters so I can roll them around, particularly on a carpet. So I'll get that done next. Now this part of things is not going very well. You can see we've got some of the laminate on the front has come up and that's okay. We can glue that back down. But the bottom of this is really in worse shape than what I had hoped. I know it's so hard to see up in here, but that particle board is just shot. And I grabbed a section to pull it forward and I just pulled a big chunk of it off yesterday. So I put some wood glue in, put a big uh, concrete block on top of it to weigh it down so it could get back to where it's supposed to be. But I'm gonna have to work on this today.
I basically just pulled that entire chunk off the front of it. So I hope, yeah, it's on there pretty good now. It's on there pretty good, but we'll get it patched up probably with fiberglass resin. I've got a couple products here I'm gonna use. The fiberglass resin is a mix and it's kind of makes a thicker, uh, more flowable resin that we'll put into some of these bigger cracks and bigger chunks. And then I have this wood hardener, which is great for a particle board that has come apart like this and it's flaking off. We can paint that on, it'll soak in, it will harden that back up. I have to be prepared though when I do that, that this is swollen and I wanna squeeze it back down. So if I've got a limited amount of time, I can use to get some clamps on there and some wood so that we can hold this thing together. So here's what it looks like after the repair. So there's some resin inside the bigger holes injected in there. And there's wood hardener that has soaked in. You can see how these fibers are now a darker color on each side. I've got a couple clamps on here. I can't squeeze it all the way back to its original shape. The particle board's too swollen and it's gonna be fine anyway this, this way. It'd be hard to tell. So I'm gonna leave it a little block on there to help hold it together. So after all this sets up and hardens, I can remove this and uh, the, the cabinet should be in much stronger shape. I'm about to do a little Bondo work on the bottom of this. So I've got some areas here that I need to fill in. I've got some pieces of cardboard that I like to cut and then tape in after I put in some Bondo. Oops, well, we'll get that in a minute. But all this is missing down through here. Um, and of course this corner here and here. So we're gonna mix up some high bond filler it's my favorite, and we'll put it in. Here's what about four coats of Bondo can do. It can make a gigantic mess is what it can do, obviously. Uh, if you've ever used it, you know. But it's important to build up just enough to have enough, but not a ton to have to sand back, and that's kind of the art of it. So I'm pretty happy with this edge that I built, and I'm gonna let it dry completely, and then I can sand it down. All right, so back to the Bondo part. Now I've been using this rasp that I got to do some real rough kind of cutting of the Bondo and get it smoother. And then I've got a sanding block with some 80 grit sandpaper in it that I can go up and down through here. I've left the board on to give me something to sand up against, but this is the edge that was so bad and it's building in really nicely. I've used a couple layers, maybe three layers now of the Bondo to build it all the way up. I've got the other end kind of built up because of how many clamps I have and the pieces of wood I have, I'm gonna have to move the clamps around and do a little section at a time. Uh, that's okay, there's no hurry with the Bondo. It's fine to do a little layer here and there. I've been using this iron out to help get rid of some of the extra rust on these metal pieces. That cage is really rusted inside, but some of the other parts aren't so bad. So I've got them soaking in a little bit of that and then I've got some uh, 800 grit sandpaper I can use to clean off the rest of the rust, hopefully. What you doing? Well, Muffy Buffy Biff Jr. and I are going on our Sunday drive. Oh no, you're not! You're gonna play pole position! <laughs>
this is what the transformer looks like outside of oh almost two days of sitting in the vapor rust it looks much better There's still some pitting and just a little light rust to sand off but that's a big help and now it's time to reassemble the transformer block as i'm putting this back together i'm using some of this deoxit spray i've got the spray I've got a fiberglass pin, which is great for just taking these things apart, cleaning them out really well, scraping them off and putting them back together. All right, so I'm gonna be doing a cap kit on the monitor from the pole position. And every monitor chassis can be a little different. This monitor chassis is called a disco DMC 2090 DT, something like that. That's the first time I've actually done a cap kit on this particular chassis. Now a cap kit is nothing more than a whole bunch of little capacitors that are gonna replace the capacitors that are on the current board. These capacitors dry out with age, they don't perform like they should, and refreshing the monitor chassis with a new cap kit pretty much gets you back to the best picture that you can get. And it's something that I do on most every one of my arcade restores. So I'm gonna start out by uh, getting out these capacitors. And the instruction sheet. I'm gonna drop these out on my paper plate. I get these from Arcade Parts and Repair. Um, the guy that I bought the pole position from had this kit. He intended to use this kit himself. So he gave it to me. So I can kind of sort them out. So these are the ones that we'll be replacing. And we will have a list of all of them that we can keep track of on this sheet. Which will also have the locations where each one of these go and the corresponding capacitor that goes in those spots. So on the circuit board, we can see things like this one right here is C602. So then I can look over on the list, C602, 470 at 35. So that's a big one and that's the one right there. So I'm gonna get to it. All right, let's just start with this C602. So I've got one hand on the back, one on the front. I can see it here on our guide. I've got a desoldering gun. So I'm gonna put the gun against the posts on this, pull the trigger. And on the other hand, I'm holding on to it. So this says 470 at 50, and we're replacing it with a 470 at 35. So that's a little unusual. I'm gonna have to check and make sure that's what we want to do. All right, so I looked this up, and the one I pulled out of here was a 470 at 50. You can always use a higher voltage like if this was 50 and the new one was 75 or something just imaginary, that's fine, but you can't go backwards. But the original schematics on this is that this calls for a 25 volt. So the 35 is fine and the 25, someone may have done a cap kit in the past and put a 50 in. We're gonna go ahead and put this one in. So the way this goes in, if there is a polarity, there's a minus, a white, it's marked by the white on the board, just like that. So we'll put the two legs through, push it down, flip it over. I'm gonna bend the legs down just a little bit and we can go ahead and solder this on. So I've got my solder I like. And you just lay the iron down, hit the spot, warm it up, push some solder on, let go. Just like that. And then we can take our legs, pop them back up, and use some flush cutters to cut them short. And let's throw them on my plate. So C602 is done. So we'll take our list and we'll mark off C602. All 
right, so I got the whole thing recapped. Checked off everything on the cap kit list. This monitor was sold to me as pulled working out of a game, but those two big caps inside the metal frame right there, those are 22 microfarad. They had 2.2 instead of 22 in those slots, little tiny ones. And then there was another one, another cap that was completely missing on this side of the board, a fairly good size one. So I have no idea if it worked how, but I'm gonna put it back together and we'll test it out later. My goal for today is to get this monitor up and running and test it and see if my repairs work. And also to see if this isolation transformer and whole assembly here will work. And so I've got a wiring harness hooked up to it now. And this is the harness that came and these three wires here were the ones that should connect into that connector down there and a ground to the monitor chassis but someone cut them right here. So I'm gonna to have to extend these wires out with some other wire and add my own connector. So I've stripped the end of each one of these and the end of the ones of the harness that we wanna use. And now I'm gonna twist them together one by one, run some solder on them, and then put the heat shrink, heat shrink tubing over them. Heat it up. So now I've got that soldered together nicely. And I'm gonna run the heat shrink tubing over it just like that. And when I get all three, I'll run the heat gun over them and shrink that down. So now I'm gonna do the same thing to the other two. So now we've got that lengthened. Give us some slack to get to the monitor from the side of the cabinet. Now I've gotta put some connectors on these. Now the green doesn't need a connector because it's gonna go directly into a metal clip that holds it, but these two do. So, I've used this before in my videos. These little wire strippers are the absolute best. You just put it in, pull, wire in, pull, just like that. And then the next handy tool are these crimpers. So I've got a couple of the right size connectors that are gonna go into the one on the monitor, I hope. So I'm gonna test it real quick. Yep, feels like the right fit. So all we have to do with this, and we know the wire is gonna be a little heavier gauge, so we'll use, well, we'll say the middle one, is get it to where it clicks so it starts. Take our wire, slide it in until you have just a little bit of the white wire insulation inside the clip. You can see it coming through the other side, just like that. And then we'll give it a good squeeze and we have a perfect end. So we'll do the same thing with the black. And I have the right connector to connect onto this and I've looked at the wires that it connects to and usually one of the wires will have a little white stripe or white printing on it, and that'll be the one you want to hook the white up to. So I'm going to put the white pin in this side and the black hot pin on the other side. And then I should be able to run it up to the monitor cable over here. Snap it on just like that. I'll hook this into the ground and I'll have to give it a good shove here in a second. Make sure it's all the way in there. And then I'll double check everything and see if we want to fire this up. Now I want to make sure this monitor chassis is properly grounded. So if I touch the chassis up here and touch the ground block way down here, with my multimeter, I get a continuity, which is fantastic. So we know that's grounded. Now this is the part where I get really nervous. So I've got all the work I did on this set up. I'm skipping the 32 volt 25 amp because that's to power the circuit boards and we're not into that part yet. Also skipping the fluorescent light uh, plug so we don't need to plug that in. But what I do have is the monitor hooked up to the power supply and you know I've done a complete rebuild on this monitor and the board did not look very good with lifted traces and other issues. So I have no idea if that's going to work. I have no idea if this is going to work. 
I have a test pattern generator set up so that it will send some signal to the monitor here so it can check and see if it's got anything. So in just a minute, I'm gonna plug it in and give it a try. Okay, so I've got the lights down a little bit in here, um, partially to see if something sparks or blows up. I'll be able to see it a little bit better and also so I can see the screen on the other side. As I've said in previous videos, here's what I can expect to happen. One is nothing because something's wired wrong uh, or the power is not getting to it. Uh, two is that it may spark or blow or something, a fuse, anything could go uh, and I don't get a picture. Or three, um, it'll just work. So we're gonna find out. So on the count of three, one, two, three. I don't hear anything. So I've got a nothing working situation. Now I gotta figure out why. <laughs> okay. Okay, step one. Do we even have power to the power supply? And the answer to that is yes. So I've got it hooked into the input right there with my multimeter. I mean, it would be a complete shock if the power cord didn't work. But we'll start there and then we'll keep moving. So now we're just gonna follow the electricity. So it comes through this line filter and it's very unusual for a line filter not to work because it's not doing a bunch. Uh, it goes, we'll just check on, I'll say the hot, the black, it goes through the brown cord, through the line filter, and then into the main fuse. And yes, I disconnected this on purpose because I want to run my multimeter up here and see if the fuse was blown, but it's not. So I got continuity here and here. So I'm gonna plug it back together and follow it along a little further. The blue and the brown are the AC coming through and the green is a ground, which is hooked to that screw and grounded. And then it's got to come back out the other side as white and black. But on the other side of this, I have nothing because there was nothing there and I had no cable to go there. And when I looked in the manual, the wiring manual, I didn't see anything there. But obviously it's just a plug that connects the two. So I'm gonna have to figure that one out. Okay, it turns out, and this makes sense, that that's the power switch. And this is an extra harness that I was given. And this power switch just ends like this, which is insane. So it's got all the connectors and then speaker wire coming out of it. And then that speaker wire goes up to who knows what. But we're just gonna take the connector off the end and splice it together and skip having a switch for now. I looked in the cabinet and there is, this is in the cabinet for the power switch. So we just don't have it out. Now I have basically made my own always on switch. I don't have a little rocker switch. I don't need it because I'm only using this temporarily. And I've got the whole thing hooked to a surge protector as a switch. So we're just gonna bypass this. This time, maybe it will turn off. So we'll try again. Three, two, one. Oh, I hear something. I hear the monitor coming up. So we've got something, it, it's a picture and it's rolling. It also looks to be off-centered maybe. So I'm going to do some adjustments and see what I get. Here's what I have. That is definitely not a good picture, especially after doing all that work. Pretty good color. The black line coming down is just from the camera. It's not doing that in reality. Hallelujah. Turns out that I just needed to move the sink wires over to the other side. They can be a little tricky on this test pattern generator. I don't know which ones I need to use. And all I had to do was that and do a little adjustment. And now we've got a really decent picture other than the burn in. So we can switch through some of our test modes here. Just like that. Got a working monitor, which means that at least some part of this is working. And that's great. Now that I have it working, I'm going to adjust the B plus which is important to set pretty close to where it needs to be so that the monitor works properly and it doesn't produce excessive x-rays and things like that. So the procedure is pretty simple. I've got a test point probe with the red in there. I've got the black grounded on the chassis. I've got a blue plastic uh, tool to go in and actually turn uh, the adjustment if I need to. It should be about 115 volts. 
All right, so it says 103.4. So I'm gonna turn it a little and see what we can do. Six, hundred and three, hundred and fourteen point five. That is close enough to 115. One of the things that adjusting the B plus upward allowed me to do was actually see these color bars go all the way to the bottom. They only made it to about halfway down the screen before. So the extra juice is just enough to really pump up the picture and make it look really nice. I've kind of got a temporary fuse in through the 36 volt here. It's a fast blow. It's all I could find locally. I'll have to order it. I'm going to order a whole new fuse block here, but I've soldered the wires on the ends. And that's recommended for this 36 volt anyway, is to not use connectors and to keep it soldered in. Obviously the last one burned up and did all kinds of things. So um, I'm just gonna use this as long as I have to for testing until I can get a new one. Now, this up here, this connector is basically all the important things going to our AR2 boards that will then power our main circuit board. So we wanna make sure the power going out is within reason. So the pins on these, pin one here, should be 10.1, 10.3 volts, something like that. It's almost 15, but I looked it up and that's not unusual with these. It can be a little high. Same thing with pin two, 15, pin three, it's all the same. The other thing that we wanna check is we have some AC voltage that goes to the coin door. And that's gonna go through these pins up here, eight and nine, I believe. So I'm gonna switch this to AC voltage. And here we have 6.6, .6, so that will be fine. Uh, that's perfectly within range of what we want for the coin door. So it looks like this transformer block is doing what it's supposed to do. Now I'm testing these two AR2 boards with the meter here, and their job is to take the unregulated 10 or so volts, 10.3 or so volts, which was about 14 something on ours, over to here and convert it to five volts for the circuit board, so a safe amount. So I'm gonna turn it on. And if we look at this bottom board, this is a five volt circuit here, it's at 4.54. So there's an adjustment here, and we know it's gonna to need to be a little more than five because once we plug everything else, the circuit's in, that's gonna draw it down just a little bit. So we're gonna go ahead and dial this one up to a little bit more than five using this little thing here, if it will turn. Oh, it turns the other way. So it was turned all the way down. 4.8. And we'll leave it at 5.02. That should be fine for now. If we go to the other board up here and run it into one of its five volt, it's at 14.6. So if we turn these, we're probably gonna find it doesn't do much of anything. And that means something is broken. So we'll have to troubleshoot and see what's broken on this board. A common part to fail on these is this 2N3055, uh, this cap transistor. And when it fails, it can tear up the board too. So it's important that this, these are good. And usually on a rebuild, we want to replace these. So I'm going to order some. But to test, it's best tested out of circuit to make absolutely sure. But if we do a continuity test, the middle of this should not be continuous with the outside. But if we go to here, to this one on the bad board, and here it's got continuity all around and we don't want that. So I have one of these, I'm gonna have to look for it and see if I can replace it. All right, well, Luckily, I do have a replacement one of these with the rebuild kit I got from Arcade Parts and Repair. So I'm gonna take the old one off. It's got a couple solder points. And then this has a screw in the middle to undo. And 
There's the other, and it's out. So these have an insulator on the inside. So here's the new insulator. And we are repaired. So I'm gonna hook everything back up and we'll test it. All right, now when we're measuring, we get 6.5, so at least we're within range. So we just need to dial that down a little bit, perhaps. Let's see what we got. Go this way. And that's as low as I can get, it's 5.4. That's still pretty high. All right, I found the culprit. R29, that resistor is burned up. It's still working, but at the wrong uh, values. So that's probably why the board still works, but the uh, voltage is wrong, it's high. Now, this one has obviously burned up before on this board, and somebody's paired two together. I don't think that's the way you're supposed to do it. And what those are there for is when the board uh, reads voltage that's too low from the main game board, then it increases the voltage, but um, with a sense uh, line. But if the connector is loose and it's not reading the voltage right, sometimes all the extra voltage will come back through this resistor and burn it up. At least that's the way I can summarize it from what I read. In any case, it needs to be fixed. All right, and just like that, we've reduced it to 4.5 volts. There's the new resistor. Luckily it was in that rebuild kit since this is a commonly failing part. And now we'll just bump this one up using the little spot here, if I catch it. And move it up. And now we're moving. Well, I gotta stop there, 5.000. Oh. Okay, so I've got everything hooked up including the Pi position board. And I had to make a little connector cable to go to the monitor that connected with my uh, tester because I don't have the right connector for it yet. And I fiddled around a little bit with the different sync settings on the monitor. And I know it looks weird on video, it looks fine in person. The picture size is off because of a setting that I need to change on the Pi position SD card, but we have the game. I was finally able to pry this thing off, get those screws out, get some of the parts off of this panel. The only real issue I'm having is that those two little tiny nuts in there are really squeezed in tight and I'm not having any luck getting them out yet. So I can't get the rest of this disassembled, but making progress nonetheless. This wood out of the top that holds the speaker and the light still Stinks a little bit, still a little moldy smelling. I want this to smell better. So I've got a whole can of kills that I've used before on projects like this. I'm gonna paint that on. And then I've got the game itself up in the back of the truck, my portable workshop. And I'm gonna do the same thing up on the top of it on the inside. I know I can't see very well from here, but that area right in there, I'm gonna do the same thing. It's just a little moldy, a little musty smelling where everything is nested up in there and it's been moist. So. We'll get that coated with kills. It may not be the most beautiful paint job ever, but it smells much better. And I can go over with some black and cover up some of the excess and get it looking pretty much like it did before. And then the other one's painted out there in the driveway and drying. Now, one other thing that we need to do is where the leg levelers were, they are completely rusted in and I couldn't get any of them to turn even with pliers or anything else, vice grips. So I'm just gonna use my Roto-Zip tool down here and I'm gonna cut them off. Now 
Now it's time for some more Bondo work. Made a little frame here for this back corner on each side. And we have some patchwork to do up top with some of our extra. Here's a little progress. It's gonna be some voids where it didn't push in from the bottom. That's all right. And I've just kind of made a framework of this back corner here. It would have been really nice to cut new pieces of wood and uh, use a little biscuit to join them and do all that. But um, I'm going to contour these back far enough that they shouldn't hit anything and they're not going to be that thick. This there for looks mainly, and I think it'll work out all right. This is turning into an all day event, but I've got the front section done. And this side, and that side, and I've got them sanded down. And all I need to do is cut the grooves back in for the T-molding. So now I got to go to this back mess, we'll call it, where I've just bondoed in a little to give it some structure. So I've cut some cardboard pieces to the shape that I want. There's a top and a bottom that I'm going to use. So once I put some bondo in, I'm going to clamp down those pieces of cardboard and smooth to that shape. Have I mentioned that I hate Bondo? It's such a mess to work with. It takes so many layers to get it right, sand it down, add more, sand it down, add more. But now I've got it all on there. I've got it all sanded through the grits from 80 to 120 to 180 to 220. So it's nice and smooth. Now, the next thing is I've got to add that groove back in for the T-molding. Okay, so here's how we cut the T-molding slot. I have a router. I have a slotting cutter on it. They make two different sizes that are pretty uh, good for these T-moldings. There's a 332nd inch and a 1 inch. I don't know which one's on here. I don't know where my other one is, but I do know that there have been times I've cut into Bondo with a thicker one and the T-molding just wouldn't stick in there. So I'm gonna go with this. This looks like the smaller one. I'm gonna go with the smaller one first or whichever one's in there and we'll see if it works. There's really not a lot of technique involved in using a router. You get to set the height of the uh, router bit by twisting this back and forth and you want to set it to the slot size that's already in there or the height just like that and then you do have to make sure you know which direction your blade is going to be turning so that you're going the right direction you want it to be uh, pushing the cutting in into the bondo on the other side and not backwards i've had it chip a lot of bondo away doing it backwards so be careful with that I tried to stay in front of the router so that you could see what I was doing, but that's where it was throwing all the debris. <laughs> so I had to move out of the way. But now you can see I've got a cut going all the way around, matching back up with the cut in the front. All right, so I'm going to use this Wellwood contact cement to glue the front laminate that's coming up off this back on. I've got a couple dowel rods in there. We're going to use those to make sure that it goes down in the order we want, which is from the back to the front as we're pushing it back down. The way this works is we're going to paint some on the wood and we're going to paint some on the inside of the laminate. Then we're going to let it sit there for about 15, 20 minutes until it gets tacky. And then we're going to push the two pieces back together. I have pole position for the Atari 5200. 
I used it as a test cartridge back in the day when I was fixing up an Atari 5200 store display. Now I've got the gear shifter apart. This little knob slides in this well right here and it needs to be lubricated. This was very hard to move before. So I've got it apart. It pushes a little screen, spring with a little ball on it, which pushes this little pin right here, which pushes this button right there that's pretty mangled looking. May have to replace that button. We'll find out. There's a couple little nagging things with this cabinet. One is that this base is not attached to the side. So the wheels are on the base, but this is kind of floating free. So I can take it and push it up and down. It's hard to see, but I think you can see it right there moving. So I'm gonna to have to take a brace and brace this so that it can't go up and down. And then on the side here, we're also a little gapped right here, but I can take it and squeeze it in with my hand. So I'm gonna have to take a clamp, squeeze that in, and brace that on the inside here too. I've run into a big problem here, and the big problem is that this harness has two parts, and this volume control and test panel switch has one. And I thought it was just a simple matter of plugging one into the other, if I can get them around here, but they don't match. This has female pins, this has female pins. So it made me wonder what this harness was doing or what, what was the issue with it. And what I found was this is the harness for the sit down cockpit version, which is a different harness than the upright. So I've printed out the schematics of the sit down versus the upright. And what I found is I'm gonna to have to remove a bunch of pins from this one and pins from this one, I'm gonna to have to redo these pins as females. These are females. And then put them all back in this connector so that we can connect in. So I've got a pin pusher, a popper, this tool right here, and I'm gonna pop the pins and start redoing it. Now they make these in different sizes. But for this harness, what we're gonna do is we're going to put the popper right into the pin, and then you basically just have to give it a really good push. You should hear a snap, and you should see Let's try a different one. Let's try the green. There you go. Should see the pin come all the way through like that. And we'll just do that with all these. Okay, so now I've got all the pins free from this connector. And all the pins free from this connector. These are fine because these are male pins. These I'm going to have to repin the ones I want to use. And these all go to speakers. So this is not a real big deal. Here's my control panel connector, and then I have a remnant of the other one here where I've popped all the pins out of it. So we'll put the two together and then I'll start putting a few pins back in and see what we get. We've got audio. Just one speaker hooked up so far, but it's kind of playing by itself because the uh, accelerator's backwards on the game. Sixty-six. What do you know? 
So who's ready for the iconic prepare to qualify? There it is. Here I have the harness that goes all the way up to the top. It feeds the fluorescent light or going to be LED light behind the marquee and the top speaker. And the connector on it looks basically like that with most of the wires broken off. So what I have done is I have just cut this connector off and I've made two new ones, one for the light and one for the speaker. So I've got each half here, I'll pop the other half off and hook them up to the speaker wire that we're gonna add and the new light that we're gonna put in. All right, I bought this hardwired under cabinet LED light to use as the backlight in front of the speaker here. And I've got it taken apart. And underneath are my connections for my wiring for it. the shifter and the steering wheel hooked back up. I had to make a little extension harness for the shifter because the other harness ended way down there for the connections. So brought that up. That way we can take it apart when we want. Put a little weather stripping on here. Ready to clamp this thing back down. One of the common issues with these pole position boards is that the battery that they put on there would leak and the alkaline fluid would get all over and basically ruin a bunch of components. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to neutralize it with some Zip uh, toilet bowl cleaner, which is acidic. I'm going to let that soak on there for a little bit and then I've got some things to rinse it off and then we can at least check the little components and see which ones are good and which ones are bad and what we might want to do to repair. that soak maybe five minutes or so and check on it. And you can see it's doing some work here and I've got a fiberglass pen and I can just go along this and I can actually see some of it come up where it's bubbling up underneath. See it popping up right there. Here we are on the progress of this. I just took some air and blew through here and it blew off all that top layer of green on there which is fine so now we can have access to what's underneath and you kind of start to see where we are with the chips, just brushing it with a toothbrush took off one transistor, Q3 right there, and Q4 is also popped up and broken, and that's pretty common, I was expecting that, and we may see more of that. Um, some of the chips are cleaning up pretty well though, so I'm hoping that we won't have too many problems here. One other thing I'm gonna do with this board is I'm gonna remove every chip that's in a socket, like this processor right here, lift it out, I've got a special tool I like to use with these, just kind of rock each side up and down a little bit, get them out, and then I'm going to clean off each of the contacts. Now this one, it looks like has a bent pin right there. It's not even in the socket. So look for things like that, any problems, 
every one of these socket chips out, cleaned back in the socket. Well, this is starting to look pretty reasonable. I've popped up all the chips. Some of them are extremely dirty. Got them all cleaned up, reseated all of them, continued to clean the chips on the edge here that had the alkaline damage. Um, they're all starting to look pretty reasonable too. So now we can focus on this edge connector over here. So over time, someone's added little bits of solder to the edge connector to get a better contact with the harness. And to me, the problem is with the harness, not with this, so fix what needs to be fixed. So I'm gonna remove a lot of this because I've bit the pins back into the normal shape on the harness and we shouldn't need all this extra solder everywhere. I can see on the very far left one there, that's got a little extra copper wire added because that's where the main power comes in or could be the ground, one or the other, that's the ground. And so there's just a lot of current running through that and I wanna have a good connection. So I'll have to see about if I wanna just repair that a little bit. It looks like maybe it burned through at one point in time. Now the rest of these, I've used some solder desoldering wick, which is this stuff. And you just lay it on there and lay the soldering iron on it and it will suck up all the extra solder. So I've pulled the extra solder off. Now the last couple of pins down here, or connector edge, uh, the edge parts right there, I have burnished with my deoxid and my brush. So I'm gonna continue with that and keep working on these pins. This is going really well. Those look fantastic. It's hard to believe. Now this is the video board and you can see the edge connector on this is just terrible. You can also see where they have done some repairs here and there. And added some sockets and replaced some chips. So I'm gonna get this cleaned up. Okay, now that's cleaned up and you can see most of the tin is gone off the copper. So I'm gonna take my soldering iron and a little solder to retin these pins or these edge connector contacts. The front side of this board is also worn down, so we're gonna tin this side down. And you can see where they were paired by wrapping some uh, strips of metal from one side to the other. So I put in some replacement resistors and some other little components here, some transistors. Got them coming up through the back. So I'm gonna take my soldering iron, solder all these connections and see where I'm at. Okay, now we have fresh components across here. I've tested them on the back to make sure that pads weren't lifted, that they're making continuity with the next uh, component in line and across themselves, and all seems to be fine. So now I'm down to one last nagging thing here, and that is that this trace, which you can see right now, is lifted. So I'm going to mix up some epoxy and glue it down. All right, so I've got some JB Weld here. These are some big containers of it, because I've used some for some big projects. They make little tiny ones too. And then I've got a mixing pad here. So I'm just gonna put a little bit, a drop of each on this mixing pad. So we're just gonna mix this up. And we're gonna paint some on. Don't wanna get it over the other connector. Push this down. There's a glued down or JB welded down a uh, little flap of metal there with a little extra solder over the top of it to make contact. It's not a thing of beauty, but it's actually fairly level. I think it will do just fine. We have other options too. We can always run the ground to the ground post uh, that's on the board and just skip this edge connection right there entirely if we need to. All right, I finally got something out of the video board. All I'd been getting before was a white screen. And I've been fiddling around with it, trying to change a few things, and hey, at least I've got zeros and some ones now. Yay. Now, 
on this CPU board this morning. I found a couple of traces that were broken. There's one right there, and there was one right here, and that was keeping this watchdog reset tab from doing anything because it wasn't connected to anything. So I've looped in some wires from the backside and soldered them down to the existing traces, which I scraped off a little bit. So now we have continuity there. Then over here we have uh, chip 6A, which is a logic chip that's almost always bad if there's battery damage. So I've cut the top of the chip off and now I'm gonna remove each one of these prongs and I've got a replacement socket and chip to put in. As I continue to troubleshoot on the CPU board, I've already replaced this chip here at 6A, which is a common problem. And then the next chip to go will be this, what we call a GAL chip now. At 7C, it's a PROM. It has a, basically the startup instructions for the processor. So I'm get, removing the solder right now. I've got a new socket to put in and I've actually burned a new PROM chip to put in. Holy crap, I cannot believe that worked. <laughs> so that new chip is in that I programmed, not knowing anything about programming chips. And now I've got a solid blue screen with a RAM 8 error. So at least I know where to go from here. All right, so RAM 8 is the initial RAM right after the CPU. And I've actually played with this one before with this Dallas SRAM. So I'm gonna put it back in. I took it out just for troubleshooting purposes, but we're gonna try it again. Well, I'm back at it with the pole position board. I got a new 6116 RAM for this spot right here. I've taken it out and the processor out and this gal chip that I burned because I wanted to check all the traces through here because I'm still getting that RAM 8 error. And as I'm doing that, I notice that there's no connection between a couple test points here and then one right there and one way up here. So I flip it over. And if I look very carefully, right to the side of this, do you see there's a, hard to see, but there's an X right there over those two spots. So I've run jumper wires across. So now they do connect like they're supposed to. I've got a glue gun. I'm gonna glue this wire down and that wire down right there so they don't get pulled off of there. And then we'll try it again. All that work and I'm back to zeros. I can't make it do anything but zeros. Can't even get the RAM error now. While I was troubleshooting, I noticed that the CPU, this sound CPU they call it, the one that wakes up at the beginning and kind of starts to self-test, pin 11 on it, which is over on this side, is supposed to be the five volts in, but I wasn't reading five volts. So I took the chip out, checked the socket on the five volt line, which runs through a bunch of these chips, Socket was fine, put this back in, but that pin does not make contact with the socket. So I'm just gonna change out the whole socket because it's all corroded inside anyway. Well, I've never had sound before. But I do now. All right, so in my testing, I've piggybacked a chip right here, which means I've taken one uh, and just set it over the top of another one without taking the old one out just to see if anything would change. And when I come around to this side, we can get to the crosshatch pattern and even to a screen that will say, press start. So we're getting a little further now. Holy mackerel. It's a hump. Two uh, chips that I piggybacked at the same time being booted right up. That's crazy. All right, so I've got the game working. The pedal is backwards because I made it backwards for the pie position, which is fine. We can switch that back. But there's no screech noises. 
there's no rumble noises, there's no crash noises. So that's kind of a common problem I've seen. So we'll work on that next. All right, I've been working on this pole position for the last week, trying to figure out using this, well, these various schematics, where is the sound moving through to output? And as I've looked through it a little more today, I found a section here that I really hadn't checked too closely, this multiplexer area right here. And so I've got some chips I'm gonna piggyback and they're out of my big generic bucket of chips. So if I turn the game on like this, and I have a logic probe, which I can use to listen to different pins on things. I've been checking the RAM and different areas, just listening for the right sounds. But you can hear the pole position just still says beep, 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 real loud. So I've piggybacked a bunch of chips. I'm gonna piggyback this one chip here it's basically one of the last ones to do. So I'm gonna turn the machine off. And this is what the chip looks like. By the way, these chips have a little dot on the top, which is pin one. So you can always orient them in the slot, right? So I'm just gonna come over here. This is 6D, it's an LS374 chip. I'm just gonna lay it over the top. like so, so that all the pins on the new chip are touching and kind of gripping the pins on the old chip. I turn it back on. Oh, well, that's a little different. So let's check some more things. Okay, so I wiggled it down on there a little better, made sure I had better contact because it was definitely changing things. We'll listen again from this side. There it is. Ah, oh, we got our sounds, got our music. So we should be able to credit up and hear something besides garbage. I think that was the right tune. Not driving. <laughs> I'm not sure why. Now I don't have my other sounds. Oh boy. Well, we'll have to figure that one out. Okay, so now we got the music going and I lost my engine sounds, but I didn't have engine sounds when I first tried this board. And there's, I think, just a bad um, connection in one of the sockets. So I knew kind of the area, I pushed them around a little bit. So here's what we have now. <laughs> And also, I think when we're passing cars, I get a, the correct sound now. I was just getting beeps before. Here's a self test where we can do different sounds by moving the shifter up and down. Sounds kind of weird still. It's like missing parts of it. beat is much louder than the foreground. I'm going to try something a little different today, something I haven't done before. I've got this little bottle of liquid tin. This costs about 30, 35 bucks, something like that. I'm going to use it to coat the copper that's exposed on the circuit board. There are ways of doing it. I did the edge connectors by using a little solder and rubbing it off. I'm gonna see how this works. I know it's very 
dangerous and noxious. But I've got to open up. I've got a Q-tip here. That's going to take a little. Okay, it just looks like clear liquid. I'm going to rub it along this rail here. Well, I was kind of expecting to see something more exciting. Something actually look like silver or something like that. We'll run it across here. I don't know what happens if I get it outside the actual copper. I assume it just doesn't stick and we'll rub right back off. Okay, so here's what we have after about seven minutes. Got some areas that filled in pretty nicely. Like up on the board up there, those are done pretty well. Here it's kind of streaky down through here. So I'm gonna get another layer of it and put it over the top. This is about four coats of that stuff and some areas it did really well, some it didn't cover so well, but it's still way better than having all the copper exposed. It looks kind of nice. I mean, from a distance, it looks just, uh, you know, like an old board. Um, what I noticed was that it's, it works a little better if you rub it in with the Q-tip. So the areas that were so good the first time were where I actually pressed down with Q-tip. And I think some of the areas that didn't stick so well were places where I would have needed to sand the copper down a little bit more, just imperfections like that. But it did really well in certain areas. I think that's good enough for uh, this board. Yay, I got the correct pedal assembly from another arcade collector online. So I am going to start sanding this thing down and getting it ready to paint. I have the pedal ready and I've cut a strip of the grip off of a longer piece like this and I'm ready to stick it on. pack up these parts, all these metal pieces, and take them to Stone City Products and have them shipped out to be yellow zinc coated. Well, here I am at Stone City Products. And we'll just hand it off and we'll get it back in who knows when. All right, so here's a fun fact. When I drop the parts off, the guy inside who's been there for many, many years said that the, the little holders for the big blue capacitors was a standard product that was manufactured here and mainly only here. And they sold thousands of them for about 40 straight years. So it's quite possible that those brackets holding the big blue capacitors came from this original product factory. All right, well, it took about two months, but we're back at Stone City Products. Cindy and I are to pick up our parts for pole position, and they are now golden looking. They still look a little aged, which is fine with me, but they look much better. Now I get to put the power supply back together with all the shiny new parts. Here's our rebuilt, refinished, put back together power supply. It's kind of hard to believe it's the same one. And here is the inside all complete.
Okay, so here's our old piece that went up in here. And here is our new piece we've cut. And it's gonna slide right up in there like that. So we still have to put a groove in it and we still have to do a cutout for it. All right, so I've drilled some pilot holes on the corners to get our jigsaw into. And we're gonna cut out that middle section. Now, in order to cut a straight line, I've got this clamp on here, which is adjustable. And I've got it lined up so that when I run it down along the side of this, just like this, It'll be a straight line. Now, one more thing we have to do is we have to rabbit this edge that's on this one onto our new piece. So I've got a router with a rabbiting bit and I've set the depth to 3 8 inch, I think. Whatever is the old one. And I've done a practice cut in this extra piece of particle board and measured it to make sure it would match. So it does. And then we're gonna put the same thing into this board with that bit. All right, so I wanted to reuse this little piece right here off the back. And as I did, it just completely demolished this. So I think we made the right choice giving up on this piece. It was not salvageable. So my grandfather was a carpenter and built houses. And one thing he always said to me when I was little and working on little wood projects with him was measure twice, cut once. Well, I probably measured the width of this five times and look what I did. I came up an inch short. And the reason that happened was because when I was holding the tape measure, I held it at the one inch mark so that I could make sure I had it exactly right. And I forgot to add my inch back in. So now I get to cut another one of these doors. Okay, I got the new back door cut and now I'm gonna put the edge on it with this rabbit uh, bit on the router. That is pretty darn good. I am happy with that. So I've marked out where the lock is gonna be on this and I'm gonna drill a pilot hole first right down the center of that. Good. Now I have a three quarter inch spade that's slightly bigger than the diameter of this lock. So I'm gonna run it down and through. Just like that. And then the new lock should slide in like that. Perfect. So today I'm gonna to do a little paint spraying. And this is my old paint sprayer. It's been through a lot and it's missing a spring inside. So it doesn't quite work the way it's supposed to. So I've got another one, a replacement, at least the top part of it. These are so cheap. They're under $20 at Harbor Freight. They work great. So all I have to do is transfer over the air gauge to here and get it all hooked up. Opus is back again. He's gonna help us paint today. All right, so what do you need to do spraying with paint sprayer? Well, you need a sprayer, obviously. You're gonna need a hose going back to an air compressor, because you need air. You're gonna need some paint thinner and usually oil-based paint. You're gonna thin it out before you put it in the sprayer. Something to mix the thin, thinner and the paint with. And a stick and some breathing protection because the aerosol is so small, the droplets are so small, you don't really wanna breathe it in. Although I'm outside, wouldn't make much a big deal, but safety first. And basically we're just gonna mix up uh, some paint and thinner. We're gonna put it in that white container on the sprayer and we're just gonna spray it.
Now that put on a really nice even coat. But what I found with these sprayers is that when it dries, I can see lines from the sprayer. So you can kind of see starting to do. But we'll see when it's fully dry how bad that is. Now, as I continue to paint everything, we've got these areas, well, basically where the vinyl's worn off and then where I've repatched in with the Bondo across the bottom. So the color of that's not the color of the vinyl. And I'm gonna use a little bit of this Kills because it tends to soak in pretty well and give us a layer here. And it tends to be just a little more yellow than white. And maybe we'll match up on some of these little angles. We're gonna find out. Well, it's definitely not perfect, but it is starting to fill in some of the gaps. We can always go over it with another color if we want. Okay, so I have sanded down the first coat on the back doors. It looks pretty good, uh, nice and shiny and smooth. So I'm going to add a second coat with a sprayer. And that is a pretty nice even surface. So I've got some of this thinned out paint from the sprayer and I'm just gonna run a little bit, just a very thin layer, just almost kind of like a, um, a polish on top of this black and we'll see how it looks. So what I've done with this is I have taken a rag and some paint thinner and I've wiped back off a lot of what I put on with the brush because I really just wanted to soak into some of the deeper areas and get it looking a little bit better. I don't want it to be a paint layer on top of everything. Just want it to kind of get in there, like I said, kind of like a dark polish. And maybe I could have used dark black shoe polish. I might try that for another coat on top of this. Well, that's much better with a second coat. There's still a little bit of waviness in the gloss. So I'm gonna run a very fine polisher over it, maybe 400 grit to 600 grit, just lightly, and then we'll see what we got. Okay, if you haven't noticed by now, I'm a bit of a perfectionist. So, you know, it was okay with the sprayer, uh, but I've gone ahead and sanded it back down again. Now it's really smooth. All right, this is my back door shine to perfection with some wet uh, finish on it now uh, with the 2000 grit. So I think I'm about done with the back door. All right, Opus. Yeah. This guy has been watching me work on the back door since day one. He says, finally, it's finished, but I think uh, I took too long. Finest back door in the history of back doors. Look at that back door. Got yourself a great back door. While I wait for another coat of paint to dry up on that silly back door, I am going to remove the control panel overlay on this so we can put a new one on. And there's a number of tricks to doing this. I like to just use a heat gun, heat up sections of it, use my scraper, my razor blade, push it off. Sometimes a thicker one to get off bigger pieces. So we'll get this going. Now I'm gonna use some of this rapid remover. It's my favorite for this kind of adhesive. It's all the stuff that's still left on this panel. So I'm just giving it a little spray. And then I can use my scraper again. And this time when we go, 
We're gonna pull up big globs of the adhesive like that. So that's pretty well cleaned up. And here is our fantastic adhesive ball we made. Fun! Now that it's all polished up, I'm gonna paint it with some satin black spray paint. We're gonna do a little experiment here. I've taped off the area that needs to be blue. And I've got a can of True Blue Krylon that I've tested on a board. It looks like it's basically the same. So I'm gonna spray some on and see how it looks. Okay, the new layer at the bottom is just a little darker blue. So it doesn't quite match. I'm not quite sure how that will look. The odd thing is, if you look at this side, it's more of a kind of a sea blue. And if you go to this side, it's a darker blue. So I actually matched up on this side, not realizing that the side art maybe had changed color just a little bit on this side and did not match. Well, it's not perfect, but you know what? It's pretty close and I'm, I'm okay with that. I still have a little red that I might touch up in there, but uh, that looks better than what we had. Well, same thing, it's not a perfect match down there, but it certainly doesn't draw the eyes to uh, the holes that were there before, so I'm all right with that too. Okay, now down here we can see where we have a really strong line between the original red and the spray paint red. And I'm gonna take a rag and some paint thinner and just kinda rub some of this off. Okay, I give up. I did what I could to make it look normal. It looks a little more normal. At first glance, it looks okay. At closer inspection, it looks not good at all. But that's the best I can do right now. And I think it's time to move on and start putting it back together. And here's the other side. It's a little better. It's a little better. In the end, we're only gonna see it from the front, <laughs> mostly. So, okay. Okay, I got the inside. Cleaned up, vacuumed out. All the dust that's been settling in there all uh, spring, summer, fall, <laughs> as this thing has sat in the garage. Try to get a lot of that out and hopefully I can move it into the house today. It's in the house. This is not going to be the final resting place of this game. We'll sort it out, but I've got to get it all back together and finished up, and then we'll find the ideal spot for it in the arcade.
think I've got it all put back together. I'm not hooking the circuit boards up yet because I want to run all of these with just the power and make sure we're at five volts. So I'm going to switch it on. Hopefully nothing blows. Oop, forgot I had the monitor hooked up. And 5.20 and that's without any load on the board. So that'll probably be fine. We'll adjust it uh, when we have a load. And here's a probe on the other power board and it says 5.19. So it looks like we're pretty well dialed in. Now I'm hooked up, hooked in, everything's attached. Let's see if the game comes up. So I'm gonna turn it on. I wanted to hear a little kaboom, but I don't hear it. So let's see if we get anything on the screen. I'm not seeing much of anything. I guess we will start troubleshooting. Now don't get too excited. This is the Pi position board. I've stuck it in there for some troubleshooting. It comes up fine. So it looks like our power is good. Okay, it turns out that the wiring harness on the pole position board was reversed on one of the boards because pin one is in a different spot than what I expected. So now I've got switched. Now you might notice the colors don't look right and that's because there's no blue. If we come around to this side, as I was putting the wires in, I noticed that one popped apart. That's our blue. See, it's got the blue stripe on it. So now I gotta fix that too. Now to make matters worse, I have all these black vertical lines on the screen. They don't go everywhere. See the text up above is fine, but the text in the middle is not. So I wonder if it's from having the connector backwards at one point in time. Quite fortunately, someone on the forums pointed me to these custom chips here, they're 0, 3, 41s, and suggested that it could be one of these causing the trouble. So what I did was I popped each one off, swapped them, and put them back in to see where the behavior would change. And then if we come around to the front, we'll see that the behavior changed great, as in the problem is gone. So what that tells me is that one of those chips did not have a good connection in the socket and just by popping them out and moving them, we corrected the problem. So we are up and running now on the front side. Now back to the front, so to speak. This glass bezel that came with it has always been, well, ugly. And there's just too much for me to repair it, which is a shame. But what I've done is I've ordered a replacement that I got from eBay, and this is the back side. And you can see there's a few little scratches in this one too, but overall it's in much, much better condition. So I've got my paint markers and I'm just gonna touch up a few of these spots before I install it. Now it's time to do the control panel overlay. So I have a new overlay there from Phoenix Arcade, which is very accurate and very nice. And I have our control panel that we have painted. I've lightly sanded it again to get it really smooth. You don't want to have any bumps or anything like that in, in the surface. I have some tape to tape that on. I have a J roller in case I need to push out some bubbles that I can't by hand. I've got a really nice soft cloth that I like to use to push things down. And I'm gonna grab some scissors so I can cut the backing off of it and we'll give it a go. I've got tape, the safe release tape, and a couple spots here, a couple spots here. I've lined up the bolt holes exactly with the cutouts in the overlay. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna peel this up. I'm gonna take some scissors. I'm gonna get this started. which for me is always the hardest part. All right, so I'm gonna lift up a layer of this, all the way across, just like that. I'm gonna take the scissors, I'm gonna cut that off, and get that out of the way. 
And then what I want to do is very slowly and very, very gently start working my way to the top from where I made that cut. So I'm going to start in the middle and we don't want to push it down so much. We really just want it to slowly lay down because we don't want to force any bubbles into it. We don't want to force any creases into it. We just want it to lay. Nice and easy. And if you do find that you've put a big bubble in it, you can peel it back up carefully. You do have a little bit of working time with this, but that went down really nicely. So I'm gonna push it down all the way. I don't see any bubbles or creases or anything like that. So now I'm gonna take the tape off that I've put on already and then we're gonna lift this up from the other side. We've gotta go over this edge and this is where it's really easy to start introducing bubbles because Wherever you push, it wants to bend it to the sides. So it's really kind of key to kind of get it nice and even. I'm just gonna use my hands and try to get over the hump here with it. Until I can just start sticking the other side down. And it looks good. Now, should we desire to use the J roller it's pretty straightforward. You can just push it down and you can hear it kind of creak and crackle as it's looking for air bubbles and air pockets. There's one right there. It's just enough to make a popping noise, but not enough to see. So I'm gonna leave it alone because I don't wanna force this material down where it doesn't belong and make it worse. All right, so there we have it. New control panel overlay, all done. much better than that one. So I'm happy with that. I have this panel to put back on. And at one point I thought I would grind and fill in all the cigarette burns <laughs> and they are numerous. But I kind of like that historical character. You know, you just don't think of people going into an arcade with a cigarette, just laying it down and playing pole position. But apparently that's how it used to be. So I'm gonna leave it for now, I may revisit that later. And now that I'm reassembling everything, I'm coming back and this gas pedal that I had so nice has sat in the garage all summer in the humidity and the end of it has rusted back up. So I've got to sand that back off and clean it back up. All right, little uh, Dremel polisher, little WD-40, and now we're nice and clean again. All right, so I plugged it in. I wanna do a quick test before I screw down this control panel, make sure that everything's plugged in right. Guess what? Another problem on the board. RAM 28, it says. Okay, I don't know if this is the definition of comedy or tragedy, but I swapped a couple RAM chips around and I'm back to having the lines on my screen. So I know I've got some bad sockets or dirty sockets in there or something like that. I'm gonna have to just go through the chips and clean them all up. Okay, I'm recording this for posterity. The game is working correctly right now. <laughs> for the next 10 seconds, 
I know this game will be working. Well, at least the next second. So we'll see what happens. Every day, <laughs> I get a different error and I have to fix it. And then I think it's good. And then the next day, back to another error. All right, after a little twiddling around, we're back in business. And I'm working on this accelerator pedal. It hasn't operated correctly since I got it. And I think that now I've got it set. So if I go all the way down, we're at A4 and all the way up we're at zero. And that's exactly where we should be. At the end, we should be between, I think it says 99 and AF, and that's where we are. The potentiometer on there, I had switched the wires to work with pie position. I had to switch them back to work with the pole position boards. So that's all that was. Well, I've managed to make it even worse. So as I was trying to fix certain problems that were coming up, I was taking chips out, putting them back in, and one of the custom chips that was a problem before uh, that I think may have been contributing to the vertical lines, well, I put it back in backwards once, even though every time I double checked and I smelled it immediately and I burned it up. So that's why you see all the white lines on the track. But otherwise it's all back together and temporarily functional. All right, it's in place. And I'll hook back up. Looks good. Well, I just got this big package in the mail from another arcade restorer. And he has made us a bezel for our monitor. Now we have this nice bezel inside. Of course, all the glass reflecting. Kind of see it back in there, and that's hiding all the insides and just showing off the monitor. I like it. Today is T-molding day. I have 37 feet of this black plastic T-molding, smooth on the outside, with a little ribbed edge on the inside to go into the slot all the way around. This should be enough to do this entire game, and it's gonna give it a nice clean look. doing great until I got to this side of the game and especially this corner in the bottom right here just don't want to grip and hold this it's going to keep pushing out back out this slot because it's just a little bit too uh, wide or bombed out for it to stick so a trick you can do is to take some electrical tape and just take a little strip of it pull this out and add tape just stick it right on here to make this thicker. So I'm going to do that here. I'm going to do that down here. And then when I get it back where I want it, I have little brad nails and a hammer. And I like to just tack nail the very end of this in so that it can't come loose at that point. this really cool color muse device that I use to scan colors of paint. So I typically use them around the house when I'm trying to figure out what paint I originally used on walls. But I'm going to use it on this machine as well and just see if there's a decent match for the red and the blue. Well, it came up with a pretty decent match for red, uh, but couldn't really match anything in blue. And even though it's not a great match, the side of this cabinet is going to be hidden anyway. I think I'm just gonna leave it be and just accept the fact that the perfectionist in me is not going to win this battle. So this is my next challenge. There is no start button. The game's supposed to start when you put a coin in and I've traced it all the way back. There's something wrong on the circuit board. It's supposed to just automatically go, but it doesn't. 
Here's how we do a little troubleshooting on something like this. So we know we've got a coin up, we're stuck on press start button. I've looked at the schematics, and if I come back around to the circuit board, the way this works is that there is a chip way down here, and I've made, made a little dot right there. That chip is supposed to send a signal that says, okay, it's time to start the game. It runs through all kinds of craziness through the board all the way around, comes out the back of the harness, and then a wire in the harness goes right back around, comes to the front of the harness, goes all over the place, and it comes to a pin right up in here. Now, it's supposed to toggle to tell it to do something, but it's not doing that. If I take my logic probe and I go up in here and I touch the pin that's supposed to be the signal, it's this one. Now what I can do is I can short it over to the next pin over, like that. Which basically completes the circuit and tells the game to start, and then the game starts. By doing that, I know that that chip down on the bottom, this it's an LS259 logic chip, it's probably not working. I don't have one, so I'll order one. But I can play the game again. Now I've got the front of this looking pretty good, but it's still kind of scratchy. And uh, there's a crack here where I broke the front of this, this little sheet on the front. And I'm going to use some black shoe polish and try to polish this up and try to fill this in a little bit. So we'll see how that goes. And while we're waiting for that to dry down there, I have a new decal for the steering wheel. So I've got to get whatever's on there off, clean it up, and we'll stick this one on. Old one's off, that wasn't too hard to do. Time for new one. And that looks really nice. I like it. Here's the after on the buffing on the front. Bingo! I replaced the LS259, hit the start button down there, and the game started. At least that problem is fixed for now. Well, fixing that last chip messed up the high score table. It deleted it. So I'm just gonna have to start setting more high scores. All right, the coin door lights are working. I don't have the little 25 cent covers for them just yet. They're hard to find, I'll see what I can do. But, game's working. As far as I'm concerned, it's done. That wraps up another arcade restoration project. This one took a little longer than what I anticipated. We had monitor work, we had uh, cabinet work, we had board work, we had board work, we had board work. And hopefully I don't have a whole lot more board work come my way. Uh, in the end, I spent a little more on it than what I anticipated with the cosmetics like the glass here and the cardboard bezel inside, control panel overlay, um, yellow zinking metal parts inside that no one will ever see. But I still came out pretty good overall and I'm happy with it. It's gonna make a great addition to the arcade and I look forward to playing it. 2023 was quite the year. We started out with the Sega display cabinet project. We had probably the most trashed Tron you will ever see. In between, I bought a battle zone and fixed it up, but it wasn't a ton of work. And then finally wrapped up pole position. So what will 2024 bring us? I don't know. I don't have another half empty, uh, completely rusted out, falling apart arcade game to work on, but I've got my eyes open. In the meantime, I do have the 
console collection, we have kiosks, we have all kinds of things that we can feature. So if there's something you'd like to see, let me know. As always, I appreciate the likes, the comments, the subscriptions to the channel. It's all fun for me, and I love interacting with everyone. So, until next time, keep on gaming. Kelly, what are you doing?